But when talking about the gospel message, what do we mean by the gospel? How should we proclaim the gospel? And so I want to suggest a revolutionary idea. I've got a radical idea for revolution. This is, this is going to blow you off your seats. I mean, you'll say, how did you ever come up with that idea? Well, my idea for revolution is this. How about we start sharing the gospel the way God does it in the Bible by starting at the beginning. Now, there's a radical idea. You start at the beginning. You lay the foundation. Then you build the structure. Look, think about it like this. When you build a house, do you start from the roof and then the walls and then the foundation? No, the house won't stand. You've got to start from the foundation and then build the walls and then build the the roof. And I want you to think about that in regard to the gospel. You see, when I ask a lot of people, people in the church about the gospel, say, what, what do you mean by the gospel? I say, oh, the good news that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. And I'll say, yeah, but you, how can you understand the good news if you don't understand the bad news in Genesis? People say, well, we need to go out and see people saved. Well, they don't even know they're lost in many instances. And in fact, increasingly, we have generations who don't know their loss because they don't understand the foundation in Genesis for the gospel. They don't believe the Bible is God's word. They don't understand about sin, and they just don't have the foundation to understand the gospel. You see, let's understand the foundation of the gospel, the bad news, so we can understand the gospel, understand it correctly. We need to lay the foundation to build the structure. What's the bad news? Well, we begin in Genesis. In Genesis, God instructed Adam, you can eat of all the trees, there's one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely die. In other words, obey God's word. But then the devil came to Eve and said, did God really say, you don't have to believe God's word. You can be like God. You can be your own God. In other words, trust man's word. And a battle began right there between two religions between God's word and man's word. You see, there are only two religions in the world, ultimately. I mean, it's all the way through the Bible. It's a battle between light and darkness, a battle between build your house on the rock, build your house on the sand, those who are for Christ, those who are against, those who gather, those who scatter. This battle began in Genesis, and we know what happened. Adam succumbed. He disobeyed God. He rebelled against God, and that's called sin. That's where sin came from. That's why we're sinners, because we're descendants of Adam. What he did, we did. Uh, we sinned in Adam. He represented the entire human race from which we all came. And as a result of that, as God warned, death would be the consequence. And now we see that the whole creation groans because of our sin. It groans every day, actually. It's a different world. It's a fallen world. You see, we could picture it this way. Once it was a perfect world. Everything was very good. But now we have the intrusion of death and disease and pain and suffering because of our sin. See, that's laying the foundation to help people understand well, we've got a problem. And we're alienated from God because of this problem called sin. Now, the Bible tells us one day there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. But in the meantime, we're living in this falling, groaning world. Sort of like this, I was over in the British Museum a number of years ago in London, and I saw all these people standing there looking at one of those you know, statues, of statues from Rome or from Greece, and you could tell that they were once exquisite statues. And I heard people saying, wonderful, marvelous, inspiring. And a little child nearby said, it all looks broken to me. You know, it, and it was broken. Uh, he, he didn't really appreciate what it must have been like originally. But when we look at the world today, we can look at our world and say, oh, it's, it's wonderful, marvelous, and inspiring. We see you know, beauty out there and looking at life and so on. But like that child said, it looks broken to me. There's a lot of ugliness out there. And it is an ugly world because we see death, we see disease, we see viruses like uh, the uh, coronavirus and so on. It's a broken world, but it's our fault because we sinned in Adam. You see, when God created everything, he said everything was very good. In the New Testament, there's a man that came to Jesus and said, good master. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God. So to define what we mean by good, we've got to understand the attributes of God. And remember, 
when God stepped into history in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he would heal the sick, raise people like Lazarus from the dead. And he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. And I believe he was weeping because of that death that was an intrusion. Actually, the Bible calls death an enemy. Death is an intrusion. See, the world we live in today is one that's permeated by death. Remember, the origin of death is in Genesis when God said to Adam, you can eat of all the trees, one you're not to eat of. If you do, you'll forfeit your right to live. And the Bible tells us that through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death came to all men because all sinned. And so a reminder that we sinned in Adam. And that's why people die. And in fact, death through the whole of creation, uh, we see death, disease, suffering. It's no longer a very good creation. And so man's actions led to sin, which led to death. What happened when Adam sinned? Well, right there in the Garden of Eden, we read an account of the first death, death of animals. God, the Lord God made for Adam and Eve garments of skins and clothed them. Garments of skins. He must have killed uh, an animal and clothed Adam and Eve. Actually, the first blood sacrifice is a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. When you walk through the Creation Museum, after you walk through the Cave of Sorrows, we have the temptation of Adam and Eve. Adam succumbs and takes the fruit, rebels against God. He was the one that was given the instruction not to eat the fruit of the tree. That's why Adam is blamed uh, for sin. By one man, sin entered the world. And then you come to the cave of sorrows and the sacrifice scene. And what we're saying is, here's the promise of the Savior right there. Even though we sinned in Adam and now we see all these horrible things happening in the world, but in judgment, God provides salvation. And so we see here the presentation of the gospel. Now, that's why the Israelites shed the blood of animals over and over and over again. It was really the setup of the sacrificial system. So why the shedding of blood? Well, Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood represents life. So we in Adam forfeited our right to live. Our bodies will die. But we're different to the animals. We're made in the image of God. And so we have souls and live forever. So our bodies would die, but then we, the real us, would live forever, but separated from God. But God wants us to spend eternity with him. And so there has to be the giving of life. Because we forfeited our right to live in Adam, there has to be the giving of life to pay the penalty for sin. It has to be the shedding of blood. But the blood of wolves and goats can't take away our sin. You know, as Christians, we don't sacrifice animals today. Uh, the Israelites sacrificed animals over and over again, but it was pointing to the one who would die once and for all. It was pointing to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, think about it. A man brought sin and death into the world. A man would need to pay the penalty for sin and death. But it would have to be a perfect man. But we're all sinners. But it has to be one of us because all human beings are all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're all sinners. So if a man brought sin and death into the world, a man, but it'd have to be a perfect man, not a sinner, would need to pay the penalty for sin and death. But it can't be one of us, but it has to be. But what did God do? Wow, think about his plan from eternity to save us. He stepped into history in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the babe in a manger. We celebrate that especially at Christmas time. To be the God-man, the perfect man. To die on a cross. We celebrate that at Easter. When we should celebrate it every day of the year. To die on a cross, be raised from the dead. Conquer death. You see, death is an enemy. But one day it's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. One day there's going to be a restoration. When there'll be no more death, he conquered death and offers a free gift of salvation for those who will trust in him. Remember, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, uh, he'll be saved. Jesus is called the last Adam. He takes the place of the first Adam. The first Adam brought sin and death. 
the last Adam through his death on the cross and resurrection brings life, an eternal life for us with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to just challenge us in regard to one aspect here because sadly today I believe there are many people who have grown up in the church who don't really understand the foundations of the gospel. Many of the younger generation that have already left the church don't understand the foundations of the gospel because we've actually been permeated with secular thinking. The idea that it takes millions of years for all these fossils to be laid down. Now, I would say most of the fossil record is actually the record of the flood of Noah's day. But the idea of millions of years came out of atheism, deism, the 1700s and 1800s. People who wanted to explain everything, including the fossil record without God, and so they said that the fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man. Sadly, many church leaders took that and said, we can add that into the Bible and we'll believe in the millions of years. And that teaching has permeated the church. And so generations of kids have been told by the majority of Christian leaders and Christian academics, you can believe in millions of years. But if you believe in millions of years, what it means is all the death and bloodshed and disease and the suffering we see today has gone on for millions of years, which means God's responsible for it. But the Bible tells us very clearly we're responsible. God's not responsible for the coronavirus causing all these problems. We are because we sinned in Adam and now we have diseases. Now, God's in charge of it all. That's true. And uh, he could stop the coronavirus like, like that if he wanted to. But in his plan as sovereign God, he's allowing all this for his purposes regardless. And that's, that's a whole other area that we could uh, talk about sometime. You know, let me challenge you for those who believe in millions of years. If you're a Christian and you believe in millions of years, I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but I want to challenge you. In the fossil record, we find lots of examples of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs. You know, originally, God said Adam and Eve were vegetarian and the animals were vegetarian. We weren't told as humans we could eat meat until after the flood. How could, how could you have a fossil record of millions of years with all these animals eating each other and so on when they're all vegetarian originally in the very good world that God created? Not only that, when you look at the fossil record in the bones, you see lots of examples of diseases like bone scans revealing tumors in duckbill uh, species. Uh, in other dinosaurs, you see septic arthritis, or you see evidence of cancer uh, that you find in humans in bones in the fossil record. In fact, the fossil record is replete with examples of you know, bones showing cancer, arthritis, infections, abscesses, and so on. How could that have existed millions of years before God said everything was very good? In fact, if you believe in millions of years, you're really saying, God calls cancer very good. No, no, no. No, it was a very good world before sin. It's not a very good world now. In the fossil record, we see fossil thorns said to be hundreds of millions of years old. The Bible makes it clear thorns came after the curse. These two things cannot be true at the same time. And in fact, if you think about it, if you believe that there was millions of years of death and bloodshed leading up to man and God's responsible for that, then what does it mean that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins? If there was a shedding of blood millions of years before man sinned, it really undermines the foundation of the gospel. And actually, when you believe in millions of years, I'm going to challenge you that it's really an attack on the character of God because you're saying God's responsible for all this disease, death, and suffering. No, we are. We rebelled against God. God stepped into history to save us from what we did. And what that means is the supposed geologic record of millions of years can't be true, which means there has to be another way of explaining uh, the fossil record. How could you explain layers of fossils all over the earth, but it would have to come after sin? Well, at the Creation Museum, we walk you through the seven seas of history, a perfect creation, then the entrance of sin and death, and then the catastrophe of Noah's day. If there really was a global flood you would expect to find what? Well, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And that's what you find. You see, the death, disease, suffering in the fossil record, 
in the bones that are there represents the fallen world after sin and the world that was destroyed uh, by the flood, not the world as God originally made it when it was perfect and there was no sin. And so, therefore, I want us to understand this. To understand the gospel, we need to understand the foundational uh, knowledge that God has created that sin into the world and death as a result of sin, that God steps, God's Son stepped into history to be Jesus Christ, the God-man, the perfect man, to die because death was a penalty for sin, to be raised from the dead, conquers death, as the power of the gospel, and one day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth to come, and that is the hope of the gospel. You know, in many ways, I think our modern church is very guilty of preaching only part of the gospel. I find many people concentrate on the hope of the gospel, the power of the gospel. They talk about the message of the cross. They talk about the message of the resurrection. But we have generations today who don't understand the foundation of the gospel. They don't understand about sin. They don't understand about their, their problem that they have and they're separated from God and that death was the penalty for sin. That's why increasingly we have the younger generations who don't understand the gospel and they won't even listen uh, to the gospel message. You know, I find many churches are more interested in talking about eschatology than they are about Genesis. They say Genesis doesn't matter, you can believe in evolution, millions of years, whatever. Oh, but you'll find in a lot of churches in their statement of faiths, they'll have all this uh, very explicit detail about what you must believe about revelation and about eschatology. It, when it comes to Genesis, oh, as long as you believe God created, don't worry about the details. And yet the details in Genesis are the foundation for not just the gospel, but all our doctrines, the whole of the rest of the Bible. And sadly, much of the church has not taken a stand on Genesis as they should. And most of our Christian colleges and most of our seminaries and Bible colleges, not all, but the majority, most of our churches have compromised evolutionary ideas in millions of years with Genesis. And we've lost the foundation. And that's why generations today is one of the major reasons they don't even understand the gospel or listen to the gospel. This Easter, as we think about the gospel and the state of this nation, we see America from a worldview perspective becoming less Christian every day. We see that in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in Canada, the whole Western world is like that. I want to challenge us that we need to recognize increasingly that many today don't understand the gospel because they don't believe that God's word is true. It's been undermined in its history in Genesis. They don't understand the foundation of the gospel. And so I want to suggest to us at this Easter that what we should be doing is digging wells. Now, what do I mean by that? What do we mean by digging wells? I think we all need to be well diggers. I want to challenge us to be well diggers. You see, in the Bible, water is often symbolic of the word of God. It's used that way uh, in a number of different places. And I want to take us to the passage in Jeremiah where we read, for my people have committed two ills. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see, as you look at that, that really goes back to that battle in Genesis between God's word and man's word. And so you have this battle between the fountains of living water, the word of God, and the broken cisterns of man, uh, man's word. This is the battle that's been going on ever since man rebelled against God. And to help us understand this further, I want to make an application of a passage in Genesis. In Genesis 26, 15, now the Philistines had stopped up the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they filled them with earth. And this is the account of Isaac, and he found that the Philistines had stopped up uh, the wells. They had stopped up the wells uh, that his father had dug. And then we read this. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And so Isaac dug again those wells. And the wells flowed freely, uh, the wells of the fathers. As I said, water is often used uh, to be symbolic of the word of God. Uh, we read that in the scriptures. I want to suggest this to us. The wells of water, the water of the word, once flowed freely in this nation as God's word, biblical authority, and the gospel were taught across this nation. And we 
could see the effects in many places. We can still see, in a way, it's sort of, um, it, it, it's there as, 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 a, as a remnant of what's happened in a sense. But we see uh, Bible verses on various buildings in Washington, D.C. As a result of the water of the word uh, being spread across this nation, churches were built, Christian organizations formed, public schools had prayer and Bible readings and creation taught in public schools. There were nativity scenes and crosses prevalent across the nation, Christmas carols and nativity scenes at Christmas, even in shopping centers and Easter pageants and even Easter celebrated. Oh yeah, I know they use, you know, bunnies and eggs and so on, but still even, even many of the secular shopping centers would uh, talk about the cross. But something has happened. The Philistines had stopped up the wells, which Isaac's father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham. And I would say that the Philistines today, the secularists, those who are in opposition to God's word, have been filling up the wells through the education system, the media, throughout the culture in many ways, atheist groups filing lawsuits to get anything Christian removed uh, from the culture. They've stopped up these wells. They've taught generations of kids to believe in evolution as fact and that the Bible is not true, it's just a myth, and to believe in millions of years that human, humans are apes, there's no God. And they've taught them then to abandon the doctrines based in Genesis. And so, uh, the, sadly, um, the belief in gay marriage has permeated the culture and euthanasia and racism and abortion and pedophilia and gender issues. We see the water of the word has been stopped up in many ways by the Philistines today, by the secularists today. But what has the church and seminaries and Bible colleges been doing? Well, sadly, the majority, not all of them, but the majority have also been helping the Philistines uh, by filling up those wells by saying, oh, to generations of kids and to people in churches, you can believe in evolution and millions of years and you don't have to believe in a literal genesis and you don't have to believe in a global flood. You know, as a result, what we've seen, we did research on this a number of years ago. Two thirds of young people are walking away from the church by the time they reach college age and very few are returning. There is an exodus from the church. And when we did the research as to why those young people left the church, we found out they weren't taught apologetics. They weren't taught to defend their faith. They were taught to believe in death and suffering being here for millions of years. That was one of the big issues. How can you believe in a loving God with all this death and suffering? Because they didn't understand death and suffering is a consequence of our sin. It's not God who's responsible for that. They weren't taught apologetics. They weren't taught the foundations in Genesis. They were basically taught, you can believe whatever you're taught at school and so on, just trust in Jesus. But how could they trust in Jesus if the book from which the message of Jesus comes can't be trusted? And we see a change in our culture. For instance, church attendance, the greatest generation, 56% went to church. And then the silent, 44%. The boomers, 32%. Generation X, 27%. The millennials, only 18%. We're seeing an exodus from the church. Sadly, that's what's happening. See, the Philistines have been stopping up the wells and many of our churches and Christian colleges and Bible colleges and seminaries have been helping them stop up the wells. And then you come to Generation Z, the younger generation, as George Barner said in the research he did, they are the first truly post-Christian generation and they're twice as likely to be atheist as any previous generation. So when we look at the younger generations, particularly X, Y, and Z, they are so much more secularized than the older generation, than the greatest and the silent and the boomers. But what we're seeing today is that the water from the wells, the water of the word is scarce in this nation compared to what it was in the past. Because we see that the broken systems of man have really taken over our culture, taken over the whole culture in the West. I want to suggest that we need to be like Isaac and redig the wells. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. We need to be redigging the wells to stand on the authority of the word of God and proclaim the gospel. We need to be out there digging the wells to see the water of the word again spread across this nation. And we need to be doing it in a way that reaches this culture is where it's at. We need to be teaching apologetics, creation apologetics, Bible apologetics to help 
the, the younger generations understand. We can answer all these skeptical questions and we can show you that what we see in this world, actually it's God's word that makes sense of it. And observational science confirms over and over again the truth of God's word beginning in Genesis. We need to raise up generations who understand that the Bible is true from the very beginning. We need to see that water flowing freely again. And so God's people need to be redigging the wells. We need to start redigging the wells in many of our own churches and Christian colleges and Bible colleges and seminaries and our homes. And we need to be going out and digging those wells so that the water will flow freely across this nation and impact this nation with the truth of God's word and the gospel. That's the message of Easter. And that's what I believe we need to be doing. Digging wells. So this Easter, go out and dig wells. Dig wells in your own homes. Dig wells in the colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries that we go to or are familiar with. Dig wells in our churches, in our Sunday school classes, in our youth groups. Take away the fill that the Philistines have put in there. The wrong teaching. And the compromised positions that many Christian leaders have taken, dig that out of the wells. And let's see the water flow freely across the United States, the rest of the Western world, and the globe. Maybe God is using the COVID-19 disease, the coronavirus, to get our attention to say, what is wrong? What should we be doing? I want to challenge us. Go out and dig wells.